You know, a lot of times in life, it's a combination of hard work and luck. And you can't really depend on the luck, but you can depend on hard work. <laughs> so, and if it's something that you love to do, then it's not, the work isn't that hard. Sometimes there, there's something you, you're not even aware of that you might be really good at, you know? And uh, so, so it's important to keep trying things. Today we're here with Susan Bennett, a singer, keyboard player, voice actor, and is best known as the female American voice of Apple Siri. Her voice has also been used in advertisements for several companies such as Coca-Cola, Ford, McDonald's, Visa Cartoon Network, just to name a few. Susan graduated from Brown University and is married to guitar player Rick Hinkle for 25 years. How are you doing today, Susan? I'm doing just fine. Thanks. Can we kick things off with a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh, my background, I was born in Vermont and my dad was a salesman and got transferred a lot. So we traveled. We lived all over New England, um, Burlington, Vermont, outside Boston, Massachusetts, outside Providence, Rhode Island, and finally upstate New York, outside of Utica, New York. And I went to college at Brown University and graduated. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, with my life at that point. I did get married to my first husband, who also graduated. He graduated a year before I did. And uh, he became um, a National Hockey League player. And so we actually moved quite a bit uh, during his time doing that, too. And eventually we ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, because uh, my ex-husband, Kurt, Kurt Bennett, was uh, traded to the Atlanta Flames when they were first um, created uh, back in, oh dear, 72, I think. And so I've been in Atlanta since then. And uh, it was really cool because I was able to sort of take my time um, figuring out exactly what I wanted to do. And so I did a lot of singing in clubs and in studios and eventually got into voice work. What made you choose a career as a voice actress? Well, uh, actually, I got into it accidentally, actually. I was a jingle singer as well as a live performance singer in the studio uh, doing commercials. And uh, one day we finished the commercial that we were singing and the voice actor didn't show up to read the copy for the spot. So the studio owner said, Susan, you don't have an accent come over here and read this copy. And so I did. And I thought, oh, ding, 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 I can do this. And so I got some voice uh, lessons. I took some uh, voice lessons with, a, with an actor and voice actor in Atlanta and uh, got an agent. And eventually I really started working a lot. Wow, that's actually really interesting. Yeah. You just <laughs> accidentally stumbled into it. <laughs> yeah, that's happened to me a lot in my career. I've been very lucky. <laughs> Can you share with us your top three principles to success? Well, it's kind of, uh, it's hard to narrow it down to just three. But the thing I would start with is um, whatever you want to call it, study, research, learning, education. It's important to try a lot of different things. Some people are just born with a particular talent and they know that that's eventually what they'll end up doing for in their life because it's an overwhelming talent that they can't ignore. And so they end up doing that. That was what happened to me because I could play, sit down at the age of four and play, just play the piano just by ear. And so I knew that music was going to be important in my life. Um, and then from that, I think, um, you know, determination and uh, uh, perseverance, because a lot of people that, become really successful, you look at their backgrounds and you look at how they started out. And many times, especially for writers, it seems, their books or their, their, their writing, their whatever they're writing, whether it's articles or books or whatever, uh, they get rejected for a very long time. In fact, I just read something in Time Magazine about Dr. Seuss, who'd had so many rejections for his first book uh, that he was about to give up. 
And then it turns out that a, a friend of his who ended up being in publishing gave him that one shot. And then that's, that's what opened everything up for him. So, you know, a lot of times in life, it's a combination of hard work and luck. And you can't really depend on the luck, but you can depend on hard work. <laughs> so, and if it's something that you love to do, then it's not, the work isn't that hard. And let's see, I can't remember when I, I saw, I filled out your little form earlier and I can't remember the confidence. three that I had. I think it was confidence. Confidence was in there. Yeah. Um, and confidence is a funny thing too, especially for people who are performers, because, you know, most of us who are in the arts uh, have a tendency to be a little um, self-critical and, you know, unsure of what we're doing. And so sometimes confidence has to be manufactured. You have to figure out a way to think positively about yourself and to just think, think very positively about whatever you're doing. And that will really help you move forward. If we can take, let's say study, for example, you know, what would be an approach that you can take to make it for somebody that's not used to it and want to start the practice? Like what steps can you take to make it more of a part of your behavior? Well, I think for, uh, for many, many people, a great way to start to do anything is improv classes. Because whether you want to be an actor or not, if you want to become successful, you're going to have to be able to relate to people and you're going to have to be able to think on your feet. And, you know, because you don't have a programmed way to, way to operate in life. You know, there's no instructional manual. And uh, so, so it's very, very important, I think, to be able to develop that. And it's scary. It is really scary to get out there and, and people are in these situations and you have to just think of something at the, you know, just on your feet. But it's a great it's a great way to get yourself used to unusual situations. And especially when you're young and you're just trying things out and figuring out what you want to do. Um, everything's a little intimidating because you don't know that much about it. And so that's why improv classes are so great, because it, it gets you used to feeling that way and not feeling bad about it, you know, because everyone has that same experience. So I think any way that you can uh, try new things, I think that's a really uh, major thing, especially for young people. You know, there are so many uh, options for you. And when you're in school, you know, you don't have to worry about making a living when you're going to school. All you have to think about is studying, learning, and figuring out what you want to do. And so it's important to do things maybe even do things that you uh, don't think you're good at. I remember when I was in college, I felt very um, empowered when they had a pass no credit program. And so you could take classes that you were pretty sure you weren't gonna get an A in, <laughs> but still take them and learn through them. And uh, that's what I did with a biology class. And uh, there was no differentiation between just, you know, everybody's biology and pre-med biology. So it was a pretty, uh, pretty intimidating class. But the fact that I didn't have to worry about a grade, just it was wonderful because then I could just be open to anything and I wasn't afraid to make mistakes because I wouldn't have to get a D or an F <laughs> for my efforts. So, you know, just, I, I, would, I, I would say experiment as much as you can. And um, yeah. I like that idea of trying new things, even though you don't think you're good at it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it can't hurt. It's not going to kill you. Right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> unless you're trying to be a pilot and you don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's definitely in things where uh, even this getting into podcasting, I didn't like it at first, but I wanted to do it. I was encouraged to do it as a marketing activity. And over time, I really got to like it and enjoy it. So that could be another thing because you don't like yeah. it at first, but later on. Sometimes like there, it. there's something you, you're not even aware of that you might be really good at, you know? Yeah. So you got to try and, uh, so, so it's important to keep trying things. What, um, what would be advice to keep from getting discouraged? I feel like for some people, they, they struggle with keeping determination. Um, you know, you can easily sort of have the down period. Yeah. And... I don't know. It's a, I, everyone gets discouraged. 
You know, it's not like you're going to just, you know, try it. And then all of a sudden you're a, a big hit at whatever you're doing. Um, I think you just have to try to, you know, come up with positive things to think about when you get discouraged or if you get really, really discouraged and you think I really need to quit, do something else for a minute and then come back to it. A lot of it has to do with, um, with your brain and uh, you're probably, I don't know if you're too young to read a book like this, but there's a book called my, um, my stroke of insight. And it was written by scientist Jill Taylor. And it is so inspirational because she became a brain expert because she was brilliant and just studied all over and traveled all over the world, giving um, papers and everything about her, her study. And her brother, who was just one year younger, was schizophrenic and could barely, you know, function. And so she started to think, well, how could that be possible when our DNA is so similar how did we end up with these two very different brains? And so she still, so she really got into studying the brain. And at the end, of course, studying the brain has to do with learning about strokes and other things that happen to us, to our bodies. And uh, at the age of 37, she had a massive stroke, which of course is very unusual at that age. And she writes in her book that she knew what was happening to her. And so she immediately called her office by the time she called her office, she could barely speak, but they could see on the, you know, on the phone, they could tell it was her phone number. And so they got an ambulance over there right away. And she did have a major stroke. She survived and it took her years with her mother's help to relearn how to speak, how to walk, all these amazing things. But during this whole process, she said to herself, I wasn't worried because I know how plastic the brain is. And what she meant was how flexible the brain is and how it, its ability to change. And so, you know, you can, if you get really, really discouraged and really depressed, you can change that. I mean, it's not easy. You know, you have to work at it. Maybe go, you know, read some uh, inspirational literature or something like that. But, um, but brains can be trained. So, you know, train yourself not to do that. That's interesting because you can control your thinking yeah. that gets you in the direction where you want to go, mm-hmm. especially in mindset, especially if you got to relearn all these things. How do you keep your level of confidence up? Well, it takes some work sometimes. You know, I mean, a confidence can be stimulated and, and kept in place if you have a lot of feedback from people. But especially now, especially in the last couple of years when we've all been stuck in our houses and stuff, you don't, there's not as much interaction with other people. And sometimes you don't get that feedback that you might need to help you stay confident. You know, it's once again, it's just uh, just trying to move your brain in a different direction. You know, when you get discouraged and, you know, do something that makes you happy, turn on some great music and jump around. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of things. And, and amazingly enough, if you have a lot of problems worrying and uh, having trouble with your brain, it's amazing how vigorous exercise can get out of that because the, the body produces endorphins, which kind of makes you feel better. So there are a lot of little tricks, you know, people have written, you know, thousands of books about these subjects. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I like exercise in the morning has been one to to help with that. Just mm-hmm. get a boost and mm-hmm. get the right mindset. I like how you said earlier, you got to manufacture it at times. I'm and sorry? You, you have to manufacture it. Oh, at you times. have to manufacture it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that phrase because yeah. it's so true that you might not be feeling confidence, but can you again, go back to that, rewire your thinking and get yourself in a confidence mode? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier when, say, if you're if you're in a play and you end up, you know, doing a great job and you get all that applause. It's like, oh, then I must be doing a great job. That does great things for confidence. But so many of us are are um, many times doing quieter things where we maybe don't get that immediate, you know, feedback, that immediate response. And uh, so I think that's when you have to kind of talk to yourself and remember all the positive things in your life and. And uh, gratitude's a big deal. Being grateful. Absolutely. 
Can you describe a difficult situation and how you overcame it? Well, let's see. A difficult situation, probably the most difficult situation that I've had to deal with was uh, actually becoming the voice of Siri. Um, when I do started doing the recordings that ultimately became Siri, it was the early 2000s. And no one, you know, of course, scientists had been working on things like Siri and Alexa for and AI in general for decades. And the recordings for these things were sort of, you know, under the radar. Nobody, all those of us who read these crazy scripts that were written that ultimately became Siri, um, we didn't really know what we were doing. We knew that the, the uh, scripts were very different from the other scripts that we'd had to read for messaging or just general information. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit because all of the scripts that we had to read for characters that became Siri, Alexa, Cortana, Google Voice, all of these, these AI characters, all of the sentences that we had to read, phrases and sentences, had to be spoken in the very same way with each sentence. It was very tedious work. Every, the same pitch, the same tone, the same uh, uh, sort of monotonish presentation, because after the recordings were done, technicians and computers would go into the recordings and extract sounds from the different words, reform these sounds into new phrases and sentences. And that's what became all these different AI voices. And that, um, here's, here's a great uh, word for your vocabulary, it's called concatenation. And when I first heard it, I thought that's an interesting word, but it's in the dictionary, <laughs> who knew? Concatenation, and it means linking things together. And that's what they did. They took out the sounds, linked them together and formed new words and phrases. And so that was a very interesting process. And the reason that the early AI voices sounded kind of like this, they didn't sound very good because it was a very difficult thing to grasp the, you know, the technology hadn't gotten to the point where they could smooth it out and make it sound human. And you'll notice that even today, after all these years, you know, Siri's 10 years old, more than 10 years old now. And sometimes she still doesn't sound like a human because she'll phrase something in a way that doesn't sound right. Like, I'm going to the store. <laughs> we don't <laughs> say that. We say, I'm going to the store. <laughs> right. So it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting process. Do they still use the same recordings 10 years later? Well, they've changed out my voice. They they had a different voice. And from what I understand this year, they they moved it, changed it into another voice. So oh. I don't know what their purpose is in doing all that. But <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I even have to listen, <laughs> listen for it next time. You got one question, Charlotte? Or? Yeah. What's the best mistake you've ever made? Once again, it was Siri. Because when I signed the contract to do all the, the, these uh, recordings, I was a bit naive. And I will have to say, give myself a get out of jail free card by saying that uh, my employer, a person that I'd worked with for years, just said, oh, don't worry about this. It's just generic phone messaging stuff, <laughs> which turned out not to be the case. You know, six years later, it's, it's Siri. And uh, so I was... In one sense, when I first heard that I was the voice, um, there were two reasons that it was disturbing. First of all, I didn't know about it. I hadn't been warned. I hadn't been paid to be on millions of, of Apple devices. That was disturbing. Um, I guess I said both, both things in one then. Um, it was disturbing that I didn't know, and it was disturbing that I didn't get paid. Oh, and the other thing is that because I was the voice of Siri, my voice became ubiquitous. It was everywhere. And consequently, even if it's subliminally, when people get to know a voice, you know, I think it really hurt my voiceover career because when I went to audition for certain things, if I weren't changing my voice or doing a character, you know, then they, they would say, that voice sounds familiar. What, who is that? <laughs> and so I have no way of knowing how it affected my career. So the way that I overcame that was to finally, after many, many months, reveal myself as the voice and just let, let myself see what was going to happen. 
You know, that's another thing too, is don't be afraid to take risks. You know, uh, some of us are more geared towards taking risks than others. And, and sometimes you just have to have to, you have to do it to uh, move ahead. And so that's what I did. I revealed myself as the voice. And then ultimately I turned Siri into a new career for myself. And that was becoming a speaker. And so I go around, well, not in the last couple of years because of COVID, but um, in years past, and I also do it virtually, I do speaker events telling people all about Siri and how the recordings were done. And uh, so, you know. Best mistake. Yeah. There are some things that you just absolutely can't help. Things are going to happen to you that you have no control over. And so the only way that you can deal with it is to accept it on some level and figure out how to make it work for you instead of against you. So all of this once, once again, goes back to that plastic brain. <laughs> and I'm sorry, my neighbor is mowing his lawn. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it. No. Oh, good. It's like barely coming in. Good to know. What's the best advice you would give to the next generation of leaders? Well, just, I think inherently be good. <laughs> try to do the right thing. <laughs> that might be a first, <laughs> but I think um, just have everyone's well-being in mind. I think that's the best thing to do, you know, because there we're in this world with other people. We can't live totally by ourselves. We have to interact with everyone else. And so it's always best to try to do that in a good way. That would be my biggest <laughs> piece of advice. That's true. What do you think that means, Shiloh? Like, do the right thing? Mm -hmm. Like, if someone's trying to force you to do something bad, just don't do it. Or, like, if someone is trying to ruin your, like, success, don't let that happen. Yeah, you have to kind of think about it in a different way or, or do something differently, you know. But stay away from that person is the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being on our podcast, Susan. Is there any way people could follow you? Yes, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, although I'm not really good at social media. So the best thing to do is go on my website and you can reach out to me through that. And my website is susancbennett.com. Or if you don't want to write all that down, you can just look up Voice of Siri. Thank you. Thank you.